Welcome, everybody. Wait, let me let everybody in. Uh, okay. Okay. Good? Yep. Okay. Um, I'll call the meeting to order and welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, just read a, a little something that I wrote um, for our, uh, our friend and my friend, Ginny Timmons Padala, who we all know passed away uh, this week, uh, badly and uh, way before her time. So um, uh, I'd, I'd just like to read this, put this together. And this is uh, probably not everything I feel about Ginny. I, I've known her my whole life. Um, I'm grateful and thankful to have known Ginny for the past 50 years, a high school classmate and friend over the years, and just a few weeks ago, fittingly, a collaborator on our community day event. Um, there are not enough positive adjectives to describe Ginny. Positive, smart, patient, grounded, delightful, warm, loving, caring, honest, dedicated, compassionate, and selfless are a few that come to mind. But I think the one that captures the soul and heart of Ginny is genuine. You could sense it and, and she made you feel happy. I know she made me feel happy. She put you at ease and made you feel relaxed. You knew she was honest. She's a shining example of volunteerism, working for a cause and not accolades or honors. Ginny's parting is another sad moment for us all in a rather bleak time, one that leaves us questioning life. But there, is a, there are many lessons to be learned from Ginny. A few are the smiles and honesty do make a difference and positive attitudes are contagious. I hope Ginny understood how well loved and respected she was. She was truly a great human. My heartfelt condolences to her immediate family and extended family and to all those who she touched over the years. Ginny was a very special person and I will be, and will be greatly missed. Thank you, Virginia and Godspeed. Thank you, Dave. Very nice, thank you. Okay, so now into the tedium of a, a board meeting. Um, tonight we'll be going over a number of chapters. Um, chapter 64, 101, 108, 114, 126, and 132. Um, we will have a break um, after 114. I'd like to discuss with the board after talking to John about chapter 126 and our, our and a few things on that. So uh, we'll have a pause there. Um, but um, I'll make a motion to open the public healing, hearing at this time to uh, for chapter 64, 101, 108, 114, 126, and 132. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we'll be, for the audience, we'll be reading the changes to each chapter, which sometimes may, and most times will probably mean little. Um, so each person will be reading that. After each chapter, we'll open it up to public comment. And so if anyone, like, for instance, after 64 Historic District, after we read the changes, if you have uh, something you'd like to add or concerns, um, we'll open that up for you, and then we'll go to the next chapter. Uh, Marie will be kind of controlling things along with Jeff, so you guys can take it away. Fran, you're going to do chapter 64. Okay, the first chapter on the agenda tonight is uh, changes to chapter 64, the historic district. Um, relatively easy, the chapter has been made gender neutral. Changes to conform to code chapter conventions and the general references have been updated grammar and punctuation corrections. We remove references to map contained within a chapter because the map is no longer contained in the chapter. We removed references to natural resources throughout. We removed reference to full or partial temporary certificate of occupancy. Section 64.3 removed the word enlarged. 64.4 C and E modified were modified to add with the approval of 645A2 was modified to delete the phrase, except that if a charge is to be incurred for such use, approval shall first be obtained from the mayor and board of trustees. And we added the phrase structural evaluation shall be performed by a professional consultant employed by the village. 645AA4 was modified to add 
the phrase, if site visits are required, they shall be restricted to the exterior of the building. 64.7aa was modified to add the phrase, in addition, any demolition of an individual historic landmark or property with a designated historic, within I believe, with a designated historic district must also conform to the requirements in chapter 40-10, demolition of a structure that is a principal building or an accessory building. Section 6411A, we added the reference to chapter 104, signs and placards. 6411, we deleted a subsection dealing with certificate of appropriateness or economic hardships for signs displayed for a certain period of time. Section 6417D, we added the phrase representing the village of Cold Spring. And finally, 6417D12, we added determined by an assessor representing the village of Cold Spring. That's it for chapter 64. Thank you, friend. Uh, anyone from that's on the Zoom, uh, you'd like to uh, have any questions or make a comment? Uh, okay. Nobody. Okay, we'll move along to chapter 101. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yours, Dave. Okay, um, this is a long one, so be, bear with me. Chapter 101 is shopping carts. Uh, it's proposed that this chapter be repealed. Is there anyone in objection or anyone in the uh, audience that has a comment on that? Okay, um, moving along. Uh, next description of changes to chapter 108, streets and sidewalks. Uh, Chapter has been made gender neutral, changes to conform to code chapter <clears throat> conventions, corrected references to village law of the state of New York, grammar corrections, fees, deposits, bound, bonds throughout have been moved to master fee schedule, superintendent of highway has been changed to highway crew chief throughout, reference to the building inspector changed to code enforcement officer throughout, updated general references, Article three, title change from protection of highway to violations. Uh, article four, uh, title change from penalties to titles and forms. Section 108-1A, two, public utility companies shall give deposits to village clerk instead of village board. Section 108-2A, 108-3A, application and fees are to be given to village clerk. Section 108-4, insurance requirements have been rewritten. <laughs> Section 108-5B, three, changed from watchman to flagman. Section 108-7A, changed application given to village clerk. Uh, Section 108-7A, seven, added requirements for sketch of sidewalk. Section 108-7B, changed to highway crew chief is approving or denying the permit. Section 1087C3 added requirements that any driveway that crosses a sidewalk minimize hazards to pedestrians. Section 108 8 changed applicant pays to village clerk. Section 108 9 changed from prohibited deposits to violations. Section 108 10 changed from penalties of offenses to titles of permits. Section 108 10, 108 12 changed name of permit to street opening driveway permit added name and address of owner of property to street opening driveway permit. 108-11, changed from titles of permits to highway crew chief. 108-12, changed from superintendent of highways to form of application and permit. 108-13, changed from form of application and permit to legislative intent. 104-14, changed from legislative intent to requisites for street acceptance. 105-15 changed from rec oh, did I just I just read that? 108-15 added references to chapter 57 and escrow deposit for village engineer. 108-16 changed from approval of engineer to provisions not exclusive. 108-17 changed from provisions not exclusive to defin definitions. 108-17 added definitions of sidewalk and utility strip. 108-19 added steps. 108-21 changed from cleaning of sidewalks, snow and ice removal to prohibited deposits. 
108 dash 21 expanded description of prohibited deposits and added a section on leaves. 108 dash 22 changed from street sales to cleaning of sidewalks, snow and ice removal. 10822 22 b expanded to include sidewalks adjacent to the property. 108-22E expanded to include water and ice draining from a building. 108-23 changed from coasting on street or sidewalk to street sales. 108-23 modified to reference chapter 71 relative to street sales. 108-24 changed from merchandise and on sidewalks to coasting on street or sidewalks. 108-24, definitions expanded to include coasting and skates, unlawful activities modified it to use new definition and simplify area of unlawful activities. 108-24B, modified, modified to include public areas and the bandstand. 108-25, changed from building materials and streets to merchandise and other items on sidewalks. 108-25, modified to include other items on sidewalks, including items such as tables and chairs for dining um, and umbrellas, dining umbrellas. Identified limitations for dining areas and display areas, including ingress, egress, height, distance from a facade, hours when items must be removed, reference to chapter 104 relative to signage, lowest point of umbrellas. 108-26, change from penalties for offenses to building materials and streets. 108-26, expanded to include streets, sidewalk. 108-27, change from uh, separability to penalties for offenses. 108-27 modified to describe fines for violation to chapter. 108-28 changed from repeal to separability. 108-29 changed from effective date to repeal. 108-30 now effective date. Article 8 or 7 notice of defects added with maintenance of civil action and other limitations not affected. That is it for chapter 108, Streets and Sidewalks. Do we have any comments? Uh, it doesn't look like any. Okay, uh, we'll move along. So Kathleen, do you wanna take 114? Sure. Description of changes to chapter 114, swimming <laughs> pools, spas, and hot tubs. Name of chapter changed from swimming pools to swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs. Changes to conform to code chapter conventions. Changed building inspector references to code enforcement officer throughout as appropriate. Added new definitions and modified some definitions. Where appropriate, changed references from swimming pool to swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs. References, re excuse me, references now made to the master fee schedule. Renamed and renumbered sections. 114-3 was fencing and enclosure, now swimming pools. 114-4 was regulations, now spas and hot tubs. 114-5 was construction and use permit, now barrier requirements. 114-6 was water use, now entrapment protection for swimming pool and spa suction outlets. 114-7 was prerequisites for permits, now swimming pool and spa alarms. 114-8 was enforcement, now regulations. 114-9 was penalties for offenses, now construction and use permit. 114-10 was variances, now water use. Prerequisites for permits, now 114-11. Enforcement, now 114-12. Penalties for offenses, now 114-13. Variances, now 114-14. New sections 114-3 and 114-4 now reference required ANSI standards. New section 114-5 details temporary and permanent barrier requirements for swim, swim, excuse me, swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs, including gates, safety covers, barrier heights, barrier materials, ladders, et cetera. 
New Section 114-6 details ANSI AMSE AM ASME, excuse me, standards for entrapment, suction outlet, skimmers, vacuums. New section 114.7 identifies ASTM standards for pool covers and alarms. Section 114-8 now permits swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs on the lot of a single family in a zoning, zoning district other than R1 and R3, requires a 10-foot setback from the rear lot line, and prohibit same in front yards in any zoning district. Section 114-9 requires a building permit for any swimming pool, spa, or hot tub. Section 114-11 requires a certificate of occupancy for any swimming pool, spa, or hot tub. Section 114-14 variances are granted by the ZBA. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any comments on 114 swimming pool, spas, and hot tubs? Doesn't look like it. Okay, then we'll move on. I have on. a question. I got a one question. Donald McDonald, 10 B Street. Go ahead, Donald. Oh, okay. Um, I just heard ASTM uh, designations and um, um, for definitions. And um, ASTM, I'm not sure how accessible those definitions are to the normal, you know, to the to the regular person. Um, I haven't checked. Uh, usually, a when I see ASTM numbers, I'm like, you know, well, that's that's not that's not something that's easily found out. Um, but I, I I haven't focused on this issue at all. I just heard them, you know, are these easily found? What those definitions are? Hold on just a second, Donald. I'm, I'm looking at the chapter. Uh, that's 114-7. Uh, uh, New York State Building Code doesn't have those definitions. Um, so 114-7, um, it identified the exceptions uh, are a hot tub or spa equipped with safety cover, which complies with ASTM F1346 entitled standard performance specifications for safety covers and labeling requirements for all covers for swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs. And then number two, a swimming pool other than a hot tub or spa equipped with an automatic power safety cover, which complies with ASTM F1346 one three four six entitled standard performance for safety covers and labeling labeling requirements for all covers for schools spas and hot tubs. and lastly pool alarm shall comply with ASTM F two two zero eight entitled standard specification for, for pool alarms and shall be installed used and maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and in this section. You ask the question whether or not these are contained within the um, building, uh, the New York State uh, building code. And I can't answer that question, but I can certainly look into it. I mean, I think they are. I just Googled ASTM pull cover, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, I'm getting ASTM International and I've got to pay the money to uh, get the book to find out what the definition of the pool cover is. And I can guarantee you that that definition is probably about 20,000 pages long. Um, I, I would just urge you to check out New York State Building Code, where I'm sure they've nailed that down. Um, um, and it might be more, uh, uh, it might be more accessible to, um, you know, um, um, uh, people that aren't in the trade, so to speak. Um, I also see in my Google search now quickly that there's all kinds of ASTM um, Fence covers and this and, that and the other, but those are um, those seem to be um, more from many. Well, here's one: all pools say they're through manufacturers saying that their covers meet ASTM definitions. I, I get, I'm not trying to upset the apple cart, but um, um, I mean, Dave, you're in the construction business. When you see ASTAM designations do you know what do you think i mean is that something that you could put your fingers on you know 
Not really. I haven't actually come across that in my, my line of or what I've been doing. So yeah. Well sorry. Um it it's it's a comment. Um again, not trying to upset the apple cart on this. Um certainly, certainly Donald, I'll take a look at the New York State Building Code and see whether or not they cover it there. Whether or not they okay. Okay, and I will respond back to you on that. Thank you. Anyone else on that chapter? Nope, that's it. Okay, before we get into 126, I just wanted to have a little a discussion with the board um, before we uh, get into the changes. Um, I talked to John earlier and it seems like, um, moving or I, I, this is just regarding the one one way streets. Uh, I have concern that um, I don't remember and this is my bad um, at the time for not uh, bringing this up, but I, I think we need more input on those uh, one way streets, um, be it a, a study or whatever or and input by all the residents. Um, on, on whether or not they should be changed. And I, I don't think we got into that enough um, when, when we talked about them. I know it was more general that this would work this way. And you know, the reasons for locus uh, seem to be seem to be good. Um, and then also, you know, how that would work and go back and forth with Orchard. Um, but but I but I think we should really uh, I, I would suggest we pull those um, we can um, and John suggested you know discussing this if we agree to just to uh, to pull those uh, streets um, designated to one way for now um, what we'd go through the uh, the reading and then at the end we can uh, we could pull those pull the streets um, if everyone agreed to that but kind of take an informal uh, vote now or discuss that now. See how people felt on that. Um, I'm personally not comfortable with leaving them in there. I'm fine. I think it'd be a great idea to also include Haldane and the Putnam Valley, uh, sorry, Putnam Valley, uh, Phillipstown Volunteer Am Ambulance Corps in, in this discussion. And I've seen, uh, I know that I guess Kathleen had gone around with, with some information and got a lot of responses. And I'm sure that for the number of responses we've received, um, there are a lot more out there that should be coming in. So I'm fine with pulling it back. Now, just one question. Are we talking about, I know B, Locust and Orchard. We're we also talking about Railroad Avenue. Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. I'm, I'm fine with pulling them out of this and leaving them as they are and having that one-way street discussion by a different board at a different time. Um, it works for me. Okay. Marie? So I have no problem with doing that. It will uh, cause uh, other effects in the chapter since the chapter identifies where stop signs are, including the one way streets removed stop signs um, at, the, at the end of this. Right now, all of those streets have stop signs at both ends. We pulled out the stop signs for the streets when they were going to one way. So there'll be some other changes that will be required. It's not insurmountable at all, easily done. And that's in just addition, this chapter. Pardon right? me? That would just be changes in this chapter. That just, in this, just in this chapter 126, chapter. right. And in addition, one other thing that will change in this is our cars making turns into those streets that now are one way against them. Good point. You know, we had made those changes, so we'll have to undo those changes too. Yep. Um, and it's not, you know, there's only a handful of streets, so it's not that difficult. We can pull those. Okay. I, I, I know. Uh, Jeff had said earlier that Tweeps was not feeling good. I don't know if she's on or if she wants to comment on that, or I'm sorry to hear you feeling bad, Tweeps, if you're on. Um, it, I don't know if she'd like to comment on that or if she, is she on? Yes, she is. She is on. Probably. I'm um, not sure she can talk. Uh, okay. You can raise your hand if you'd like to comment, I she guess. She just or, unmuted herself, so. Okay. I, I think you're up. I'm not sure if you're unmuted. I can't. Uh, I'm okay with. Oh, uh, can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? A little bit. Oh dear. Um, I will write my. I'm okay with the holding. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> we got that much. You're okay with pulling us what I got, so I think that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Okay, so just for the viewers, we will be at the end of this um, pulling, um, we'll, we'll just hold this chapter, we'll go through this now for other comments, but at the end we will, uh, you know, vote to, uh, to remove those. I think that, that's how John had suggested we do it. So I'll follow his, uh, his advice on this. Sounds good. We'll read through one, 126. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to put up the changes to 126 so everybody can follow along as they are like, as it is rather lengthy. And it make more sense if you could probably, if you see it also. Okay. Okay, Fran, you're going to start us off. Okay, um, change the description of changes to chapter 126. Um, this is the easy part. Um, changes to conform with code chapter conventions, and we updated the general references and updated references to New York State vehicle and traffic laws. In section 126.18, we changed the word suffered to permit. We deleted registered in the name of or operated by such person. In 126.18.1, we added the phrase commonly known as the Food Town Shopping Center. In 126.18.2b, Parking spaces at shopping centers was, were, was replaced with handicapped parking in the B2, B3, and B4A districts. We replaced the phrase, the word shopping center with business or facility in the B2, B3, or B4A zoning districts in multiple places. In 126.18.2C1, we added the word specific. In 126.18.2C2, and I believe this is the area on handicapped spaces. We changed 125 Main Street to 91 Main Street. We changed 76 Main Street to 116 Main Street. And we renamed the VFW Hall to 34 Kemble Avenue. 126.18.2 D1 added for or on the vehicle license plate. In 126.18.3 B3, we added this trailer can be left in place for no longer than 48 hours. In 126.19, we deleted acting in accordance with instructions issued by the mayor and board of trustees. In 126.22, we replaced A with B, A and B with a fine and or imprisonment as determined by New York State vehicle and traffic law. In 126.23a, table one has been changed to reflect new fines. Please refer to the table to see the changes. And that table is, I believe, on, on the village website. That's my section. Hey, Dave, you're next. OK, 126-24a, uh, uh, modified to be every person convicted of a violation of any of the provisions of this chapter for which other for which another penalty is not provided shall be punished by fine or by imprisonment according to New York State vehicular or vehicle and traffic law. 126-24D modified to be the owner of a vehicle removed by an authorized tow company shall be responsible to pay in addition to the ticket issued by the village of Cold Spring, the full amount charged by the tow company. 126-24D, renumbered to 124-26E. 126-24E, renumbered to 124-26F, added or shall be continually secured and deleted parking. Uh, 126-28, changed one-way roadways from section one to schedule one. Text converted into a table of note uh, new one-way streets are B Street, Locust Ridge, Orchard, Orchard Street, Railroad Avenue, where change is to, is to text only. That is, it has no effect on traffic and is to correct the text only. It is so noted. Uh, are we going to, how are we doing these? So, so what is currently displayed is what you just discussed, Dave. Uh, so we will have a vote on this after we get through 126, with the exception of the third row, added no change to added, 
Mountain Avenue. There's no change to traffic, but the current chapter 126 does not identify the westbound from Cedar Street to Locust Ridge as a one-way traffic. So this Currently. is a correction to the, uh, the code. Okay. Marie, can I ask a question before we move on? Um, in the two that in, what they've read above, 126-24D is renumbered. Should that say 126-24E? And 126-24E is renumbered to 126-24F. Is that correct? Uh, I have to look. I'm sorry, I didn't look at it earlier. But it, we're all in 126. Right. Yes, 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 yes. My mistake. Renumbered okay. to, to 126. So 126-24D, renumbered to 126-26E. And 126-24E is renumbered to 126-26F. Okay. Error on my part. Thank you. Okay, the next um, topic, schedule 126-29, schedule II, prohibited turns at intersections. The text has been converted to a table where the change to this is where the change is to the text only. That is, it has no effect on traffic and is to correct the text only. It is so noted. So going down the rows, um, Benedict Road currently does not identify that there is no, that you cannot turn into Food Town Plaza. Cross Street, um, what the change is here is the adjustment of the times of day on Sundays when the turn is not permitted. Um, Depot Square is relative to the one-way traffic. Uh, Fair Street, this is no change to the traffic. This is adding the, um, the fact that you can't do, make a turn into Cross Street. Uh, Kemble Avenue, this is no change. It corrects that there's no left turn into Rock Street. Um, the added Main Street in bold, that's the B Street one way. Added Main Street in bold, that's Locust Ridge one way. Um, added uh, no change to traffic Main Street left or right into Church Street. There is no change here, but it needs to be added to the code. Uh, the same thing with Campbell Avenue it needs to be added to the code. Um, and also uh, Mountain Avenue into Cedar Street, there needs to be a change to the code. And that, sorry, I need to continue. Uh, added Mountain Avenue, uh, this has to do with one way, with the one way traffic from Orchard Street um, route 9D, this adds to the code, the prohibited left, left turn uh, for southbound entrance into um, the Butterfield complex. And uh, West Street, this adds the notation that there is no right turn onto North Street from uh, West Street. Chapter section 126-30, schedule III, U-turn prohibited. We've added the phrase, all one-way streets listed in uh, section 126-28 above. In addition, U-turns are prohibited on. The text has been converted to a table. The table has deleted all one-way streets based on the above wording. Next is schedule IV through, st through streets. The text has been converted to a table where the table is, where the changes to text only that is it has no effect on traffic and is correct and is to correct the text only it is so noted so Campbell Avenue is I has been identified as a through street uh, Mountain Avenue has been deleted as a through street um, looks like a, Northern Avenue has been deleted as a through street uh, the boulevard has been added as a through street as it turns out, through, through streets, the designation of a street as a through street has really no effect on the traffic whatsoever. But it is a section that we have in our chapter and we want to make sure it is correct. That's it for me. Kathleen. Okay. I will do my best. And Marie, if there are any corrections as I go through the table, 
feel free to hop in. Okay. 126-32, um, Schedule 5, Stop Intersections. Text has been converted to a table. Where change is to text only, that is, it has no effect on traffic and is to correct the text only, it is so noted. Changes are noted. Uh, stop sign on B Street, deleted at the north end, the intersection of Mountain Avenue. That obviously be, will be affected by the further discussions. Um, adding uh, a stop at Mountain Avenue and Craigside Drive. Adding a stop Forge Gate and Lund Terrace. Adding a stop at Forge Gate and the, the Boulevard. Adding a stop Haldane Street and Route 9D. And this next one again is will be um, impacted by the further conversations, deleting the stop sign at Locust Ridge and Mountain Avenue, deleting the stop at Orchard Street and Route 301, which again, we'll need further discussion. Railroad Avenue um, at Depot Square will need further discussion. Added uh, stop at Wall Street and Furnace, added a Wall Street and Marion Avenue, stop at Wall Street and Marion Avenue. 126-33, Schedule 6, Yield Intersections, Converted Text to Table, No Changes in Table. 126-34, Change Speed Limit from 15 miles per hour to, to 30 miles per hour. Deleted, the village speed limits as listed in this section shall be reduced from 30 miles per hour to 15 miles per hour on all village streets except, and then it would carry on. Change the text to table. Table identifies school zone areas on Route D and Route 301 where speed limit is 25 miles per hour during school hours. Deleted limitation on other streets shall be deleted as is consistent with these proposed changes. And Marie, just for clarification, the change in 126-34 um, is driven by state traffic law, right? That is correct. The state only, the state does not give to lo local municipalities the authority to change a speed limit below 30 miles per hour, except in school zones, and it defines school zones. Um, it, the last time I checked, the state had permitted two municipalities to have a lower speed limit from 30 miles per hour. Both of those municipalities had speed limits lower than 30 miles per hour in municipal parks. Um, we've, tr we've tried to go back to the state on this and unsuccessfully, they, uh, this is not something that they will um, uh, delegate to uh, local municipalities. It's a state law. <coughs> so signs, signs that have existed around the village at 15 miles an hour did not conform to state law. That is correct. We discussed, we had this discussion um, when we made the changes to chapter 126, I'm going to say in 2017, um, and I can't remember what the changes were, but we had that discussion and decided at that time to leave the signs as they are. Um, and over time, those signs will be removed. Thank you. Just good to clarify for folks who weren't paying attention all that long ago. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm on. You're on, Fran. Okay, section 126.35, schedule eight. No parking at any time. We converted the text to a table. And where the change is to the text only, that is, there has no effect on parking and is to correct the text only, it is so noted. <clears throat> Many new no parking areas are to conform with New York State DOT requirements for setbacks from crosswalks. Changes other than rewording are noted. Okay, the first, we added Academy Street on the west side, it's no parking from Main Street south for 50 feet. Um, B Street on both sides, the entire length was added. Um, we deleted Chestnut Street on the east side from the senior citizens walk to 50 feet north of the hydrant. We added Church Street on the west side from Main Street to the drive, to the driveway to 7-9 Church Street. We added Church Street on the west side on the northwest corner of Church Street from Northern Avenue, 24 feet south. 
we added Church Street on the east side from the crosswalk north for 20 feet. We added Depot Square Railroad Avenue on the north side, the angle in front of the north end of one Depot Square, that's where the ice cream parlor is, so there's no parking there. We added Depot Square on the east side from Main Street 18 feet north. On Fair Street, both sides, the times are changed from 6 a.m. It was 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Sundays and is now, um, let me see. Okay, I know there's something here, there it is. It is now uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sundays. And it was 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturdays. And it's now 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturdays. And it said from Main Street to Northern Avenue, except the parking will be permitted on the east side of Fair Street. Okay, so we've changed the timing on um, Fair Street parking. Right. On Fishkill Avenue on the east side, we changed it from Mountain Avenue South for 18 feet to from Mountain Avenue South for 34 feet. On um, Fishkill Avenue on the east side, again, from Mountain Avenue North for approximately 70 feet. <clears throat> and we added Grandview Terrace on both the north and the south sides within 100 feet from Morris 9D. Then we added Haldane Street on the south side, the entire length, there will be no parking. That's um, the end of my section. Thank you. Dave, you're up. Okay, on Haldine on the north side, uh, no parking between, between no parking signs at entrance to McConville Park. On High Street, uh, east and west from Crosswalk North for 20 feet. Um, on Campbell Avenue on the east side from the south side of the Crosswalk at Main Street uh, for 39 feet south. On uh, Main Street, south uh, from Furnace Street for 20 feet west from Crosswalk. On uh, Main Street north from Morris Avenue 90 east uh, for 20 feet from Crosswalk. On uh, Main Street south from Chestnut Street west for 20 feet from Crosswalk. On uh, Main Street north from Church Street for 20 feet east of Crosswalk. On uh, Main Street north from Fair Street east for 20 feet uh, plus Crosswalk. Church Street east for 20 feet plus crosswalk. On uh, Main Street South from Kemble Avenue, 20 feet for uh, 20 feet west of crosswalk. Uh, Main Street South from 87 Main Street for 20 feet from crosswalk. Jeff, I can't see anymore. Now I don't know where I am now. Uh, <laughs> Main Street South from 87 Main Street for 20 feet from crosswalk. Uh, Main Street South from Garden Street, 20 feet west of Crosswalk. Uh, Main Street North from Fishgale Avenue East for 20 feet west from Crosswalk. Uh, Main Street North, oh, no, nope. uh, Main Street South from Academy Street for 20 feet west from Crosswalk. Uh, Main Street North from Locust Ridge for 20 feet from Crosswalk. Main Street South from 20 feet east and west of Crosswalk at Maple Terrace Steps. Marion Avenue, uh, change in parking west from one Marion Avenue to Wall Street to entire length. Added uh, no change in parking in Market Street east from 40 Market Street to 7 Market Street. Uh, and finally, Morris Avenue west from Northern Avenue south for 36 feet. Thanks. Continuing on. What did you say, Marie? I'm continuing on with uh, no parking. Mountain Avenue. This is a change to parking. Uh, this is on the south side from Locust. It used to be from Locust Ridge to opposite Haldane School entrance. It is now going to be from Locust Ridge West to, to crosswalk across Mountain and 20 feet west of said crosswalk. We deleted on Mountain Avenue from Craigside Drive to Locust Ridge on the north side. On Northern Avenue, we have added on the north side from Morris Avenue west for 25 feet. On Northern Avenue, um, no change in parking from Garden Street, 25 feet west on the south side. Uh, also on the south side of, uh, Mount of Northern Avenue from Garden Street, 25 east, 25 feet east, added on Rock Street on the east side, 
from the southern end of the crosswalk at Main Street south for 20 feet. Added with no change in parking, Rock Street on the east side from 69 feet at the southern end of the crosswalk at Main Street for 89.3 feet. Added on Stone, Stone Street, both sides of, sorry, both Stone Street from Main Street North for 18 feet, both sides. Stone Street East uh, from a 16 to 18 stone to Cross Street. Wall Street, both sides, entire length, no parking. West Street, no change in parking from north end of street to designated parking. That was what it currently, it currently says to north end of street to south corner of three West Street. Over to you, Kathleen. Okay. 126-37, schedule nine, no stopping or standing, text changed to table, changes are noted. Added Main Street from Eastern entrance to the subway to Lund Terrace. Added Main Street in parentheses end to Depot Square turnaround. 126-39, schedule, are we skipping one? No, schedule 12, limited time parking, text changed to table, changes are noting. Okay, so let's see if I can remember how this went <laughs> and read it out in a way that isn't completely mind numbing. So on both sides of Depot Square, the limit will be two consecutive hours from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It changed 11 spaces on the west side and the entire east side. Is that an understandable way to go through that, Marie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fish Street on the east side, the limit will be four hours from change from four hours to two consecutive hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the entire street. On Main Street on the south side, four consecutive hours, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. From Hudson River, from the Hudson River to High Street, changing it from Hudson River to High Street to from Lund Terrace to High Street. Main Street on the north side, four consecutive hours, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The change is from Church Street to the Hudson River to from Church Street to Depot Square. Added Main Street on the north and south sides, two consecutive hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Changed from Metro North Railroad tracks to Hudson River. And I don't know what that dangling, oh, this goes to the one on the next page. Do you want me to keep going on the next page, Marie? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. So Main Street on the north side, 15 minutes changed in combination with next row, northeast corners of Main and Garden and Stone. Main Street, north side, 15 minutes, changed from northeast corners of Church, Fair, Garden and Stone to northeast corner of Church Street, Fair Street, east of Crosswalk and on 20 feet from there. Main Street, east, from four hours to two consecutive hours, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., changed from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and changed from the entire street from railroad to Main Street to from 7 Market Street to Main Street. Market Street East, two consecutive hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., changed from Lund Terrace to, to Metro North parking lot, or Lund Terrace to Metro North parking lot. New Street, south side, from four hours to two consecutive hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., change from municipal lot to park to from New Street municipal lot to West Street. North Street, south side, from four hours to two hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., text change from entire street to from 15 feet east of the fire hydrant to the North Street driveway of 34 West Street. Uh, West Street on the west side, two hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., change from entire street to three West Street to pump station, just getting more specific on locations. And then uh, I think the word added goes with the next page. Do you want me to yeah. continue? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And added West Street, east side, two hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., North Street to Main Street. Section 126-40, Schedule 13, Truck Exclusion, added 
and 24 hour, I'm sorry, 24 feet in length. Added reference, New York State Vehicle and Traffic Law, Article 39, Chapter 1640.20. The specified streets are as follows. Text changed to table. Changes are noted. Deleted Orchard Street, entire length. Deleted Railroad Avenue, entire length. So meaning, mm -hmm. sorry? Added, added railroad. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Real, added Railroad, entire length. Um, so meaning the, the, the limit is gone on Orchard and added on Railroad Avenue. Mm -hmm. 126-42, restricted parking. Text changed to table, changes are noted. Main Street on the south side in front of Village Hall. Restriction changed from police vehicles only to police vehicles only Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. for quick business in Village Hall. That completes the changes to chapter 126. Dave, you wanna have the discussion now? Well, I think John said to, go to um, to uh, John's not here. Um, he, John's not on, is he? Not seeing not yet. No. Is John on? No, no he's not. That he was going to be here at seven fifteen. He's not on yet. No, uh, no. I think. I think he said to go through the public comment and then at the end of that to uh, to vote to remove those. Um, so I guess if there's public comment or should we, I guess we should read the uh, comments that were sent to us yep. and, uh, and then have public comment and uh, with the understanding that we will be voting on removing the one-way streets. Um, so I'll read, uh, the first one is from Michelle Smith. Dear Jeff and Kathleen, thanks for posting on this. I plan to attend public hearing if I'm back in Cold Spring on time. Meanwhile, my comments are as follows. Parking across driveways, limits driveway, exit options. The parking on Orchard Street is chaotic during school pickup and drop off to the extent that parents often park across the portion of residents' driveways. When that happens, the impacted resident is left with limited choices to back out of their driveway if you can squeeze by. During those times, often only one option is available. You are forced to back out uh, either facing north or south, but one of the alternatives is blocked off completely. Small parking spaces force the overlap with driveway. In, many in my case, the small space between 13 Orchard Street and 11 Orchard Street forces people to park across my driveway, sometimes blocking three to four feet of my south side, so that I have to back out across my front garden and end up facing south, which would be against the proposed traffic pattern. Proposed remedy, uh, it's number three, proposed remedy to limit parking across Orchard Street driveways particularly at 13 Orchard Street. I would support the proposed proposal if we fix this parking problem. I propose that parking signs and other deterrents be used to prevent parking across people's driveways. In particular, I would like a no parking cross put on the road between 11 and 13 Orchard Street with no parking sign. That way I would always have space to back out facing north and then I would be supportive of this proposal. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Michelle Smith, 13 Orchard Street. Uh, let's see. Next, we have uh, Sylvia Wallen. Um, I travel most village roads with daily regularity, and my comment is to reconsider converting B Street into a southbound road. Northbound could work better. The road is narrow, and most homes on the east side will have a challenging time opening their driver's doorways uh, to, towards their homes. It will require parking further into the street. The first home with twin uh, stone pillars framing their driveway might be challenged from the angle of entering from the north. The angle driveway of the Sa Saunders home uh, with several cars uh, should be looked at to see if feasible to change the parking angle. Sincerely, Sylvia Wallen. Uh, next, Jeff O'Neill. Uh, uh, as a Locust Ridge resident who already functionally treats our, our block as a one-way southbound street, I'm all in favor of this proposal. For what it's worth, Fishkill Avenue between Main and Mountain is narrow and can be tight for two-way traffic as well. That's a short one. Thank you, Jeff. Um, 
And was there one more that was sent? I don't have it. I think Jeff, yeah. did you have one more? There were actually, there were two more that came in late this afternoon. Do you want me to read them? Oh uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, the first one is from Megan Shea. Uh, my husband and I live at 15 Orchid Street, which is the first house on the Northwest side of the street. In the morning, we walk our child to Haldane Elementary. We find the intersection of or Orchid and to Mountain Avenue to be particularly dangerous at this time of day because with all the parking on Mountain Avenue, it is difficult to see cars turning onto Orchard for a mountain. We welcome a one lane designation for Orchard as it would solve the trouble with crossing Orchard or Mountain on the way to school. Additionally, we have, we have recently had problem with people exiting Haldane by car and using these peaceful streets as a kind of racetrack. Reducing two-way traffic in the area would help our village police be able to track the speed of cars exiting Haldane. Best, Michael Gilhorn and, and Megan Shea. And the next one was from uh, Lauren Wallace Hall and Nathaniel Brotherhood of Three Orchard Street. Dear Cold Spring Village Board, we will be unable to attend the board meeting scheduled for this evening. We would like to express our enthusiastic support for Trustee Foley's new traffic proposal for making Orchard Street and Locust Ridge one-way streets. During the school year, parking and two-way traffic become very heavy and at times dangerous for young children exiting cars and crossing the streets, particularly those unaccompanied by adults. And we feel this would greatly improve the safety for all. In addition, we hope the village will consider the installation of speed bumps on these streets to encourage lower speeds and more attentive driving. Many thanks, Lauren and Nathaniel. And that's it. Okay, thank you to all those that took time to write. Can I, can I comment? Uh, yeah, we're gonna open it up to the floor, Donald. So uh, okay. uh, you can, you're first up. Okay, thank you, Donald McDonald, uh, 10B Street. Um, I um, am against the idea of making B Street a one way. Um, either way, um, uh, I think uh, B Street is fine two way. Yes, it's, uh, it's narrow and yes, you have to navigate sometimes, but I think actually that keeps the speed low and keeps people on alert. And that's what is nice about B Street that kids play in the street and you know it, it, uh, it all seems to work out fine. Um, I never go southbound on B, on B Street for two reasons. That end of B Street uh, uh, with uh, Peter Sanders and across the street is, uh, is kid central. And uh, I'd rather not you know um, drive through them or make a hazard. And also coming down the hill, um, um, you've got uh, a, a big uh, grade cut coming down that hill. And when you get to the sidewalk, you've got two high st wall, retaining, stone retaining walls. So it's impossible to see a pedestrian coming on the sidewalk. And it's impossible for a pedestrian to see a car coming on B Street. And so there's always this, um, this shock of the driver, no matter how slow you're going, and the pedestrian, and especially the way they make car. Well, I won't get into that today, but um, <laughs> I, I think it's it, it's just a bad situation to go south. So I don't. Um, but I, 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 I again, I feel that um, if anything, we would just leave B Street as two way. Then you can choose which way you go depending on what's going on on the street. Those are my comments, and I appreciate you holding off and. Uh, carrying on a more detailed hearing with more residents uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Uh, um, Matt Francisco. Matt Francisco, 18 Orchard. Um, I'd like to thank the mayor actually for kind of pulling this back because I think there's been little, if, uh, if any, public discussion on this, which is a major change. And I think to, to his point about professional study, I think that's really warranted here to expand a little bit on my neighbor across the street, Michelle Smith, um, based on how heavily the village, how heavily the street is parked and how close people are on either side of your apron, whether one or both, if you have a normal size driveway apron, it does limit your, your choices. You can often only go one direction and even that's been challenging. Um, even putting aside the, uh, you know, the clear lack of consideration during you know, drop off uh, and pick up. 
So I think that it's important to get a professional to kind of look at this and look at turn studies because these these kind of, you know, layman's kind of emotional reactions of, you know, one way is safer. I think Donald's Donald McDonald's point is great. You know, it may well be that professionals will tell you two way and narrow is safer because it forces you to attend. All that to say that while I appreciate, you know, the board's focus on, you know, looking at quality of life, I think it's professionals that could provide the most information as to what the impacts of these changes might actually do, as opposed to a lay person's concept of, well, this will be safer, because oftentimes the reality of it is different than what kind of your your gut reaction would be. Um, and I think it would be very valuable to get the opinion of, you know, of a professional that can look at things like turn radiuses, you know, street wet, you know, street width. And obviously there's a lesson of Church Street too, and maybe, you know, in including those folks into how well did that go, right? When you and what the challenges are down there. But again, I'd like to thank Mayor Mirandi for pulling this back because it kind of surprised me that this was the last bite at the apple and it was kind of tucked into a chapter. Um, been a little busy, but follow things a little close and 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 missed these kind of major changes, which is uh um anyway, glad to hear that you pulled it back. Thank you very much. Okay, the, um, I have someone whose hands raised, it's just identified as fire tablet. So please identify yourself and your address. Hi, Mayor Tom Corliss, uh, 184 Main Street. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I uh, just uh, I, I touch on a couple of things. Um, I, I think uh, this, this alternating one-way streets in this in that area up there i think that's actually going to create more traffic on certain streets whether you make b, uh, b street a one-way street or not nobody even knows b streets there and i think it's just going to divert more traffic onto the streets that are going to be the opposite direction whatever that is trying to get at it out of that area off of mountain avenue um the hourly parking uh i worked for the village of cold spring for 15 years you're going to have to hire more people <laughs> because by the time you by the time you walk around and chalk tires on all these streets, your day is over. So it, it's it, to to go from four hours to two hours is is a task. It was it was difficult to say the least with the four or five hours at that time. There was uh, multiple streets with multiple different hours, and it was it was like uh, doing a math project just trying to figure out what street to to figure out what you were looking at to begin with. Um, along those lines, Railroad Avenue going one way doesn't affect me, but we looked at that a number of times and you end up creating a dead end on the depot and that becomes a problem. Uh, I think that's that's another something that uh, along with what Matt said, somebody's going to have to look at that to see what's uh, reasonable one way or the other. You have to get a uh, deliveries in there and they have to get out and there's really no place to turn around. So, um, the prohibited turns. I, 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 I didn't get a lot of that. Uh, we just got back from a football game. Uh, prohibited turns going into one-way streets. Sounds like you put a lot of work into that. I'm not sure if that was really necessary. If the streets are one way, you're going down a one-way street. I don't know why you got to go crazy with the one-way turns. Um, Locust Ridge, I read some things about uh, the confusion that's been like that for 20 years probably and i'm not sure where all the confusion is all of a sudden come from as far as b street goes back to b street i agree with what matt and mr mcdonald also said that that is it's it's more of an alley than anything i don't think it needs to be a one way there's very limited traffic on it there's besides the residents i think we have uh the garbage truck, which I think they have a problem with the uh, the grade coming off of Main Street, where they ended up they end up usually backing down to pick up the garbage because they don't want to don't want to deal with the grade and their 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 tailgate going out onto Main Street, and then they go back out towards Main Street or uh, Mountain Avenue rather. Um, the street is a disaster to begin with, uh, as long as we're talking about it, and it's falling apart. The sidewalks are useless um you can't even put a stroller on them. they're falling apart and uh, maybe that's something down the road i'm not looking to, looking for you to spend a whole bunch of money on like i said an alleyway 
but maybe eliminating the sidewalks and putting some bump outs where the the water water connections are and a few very few houses there's only five houses actually on b street that have walkways that come out to the sidewalk maybe bump outs like they have uh on the curb lines going up and down main street up by uh Crown Street, where the where the, the curb line bumps out to accept the sidewalk and stuff like that, that might be make a little bit more room on B Street. But again, I don't I don't I don't think a one way is an answer to 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 B Street. Well, U turns. I can't go down Main Street any given day of the week without people doing U turns. Up and down, just trying to get a parking spot. So. With all these things being said, we could put up all kinds of signs, but nobody pays attention to the 32 U-turn signs on Main Street. <laughs> That's all I got there. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine Hansen. Hi, um, I am on the, the Kids Central end of B Street. Um, my wife and I and our three-day-old son, so uh, we're definitely focused on the safety of the street um, for our driveway. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it though. It's, it's nearly impossible to get in or, in or out um, as it is now. And sometimes the only way for me to go is left. And sometimes the only way to go is right depending on how my neighbors are parked. So it would be very, very difficult um, if it was a one-way street, but that's, that's all I got there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Nobody else has a hand raised. Okay. Dave right. John is on the call also now. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's uh, <laughs> a little too late, I guess. Uh, uh, well, I guess. Uh, hey, John, are you there? Un unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. What's hey, up? John. What did I no, miss? So um, following up on our, uh, you know, putting it actually into action, our uh, conversation earlier today. Uh, so we, we discussed uh, before we went into the uh, chapter 126, um, you know, pulling those one-way streets and everyone agreed to that. Um, and then we just heard public comment uh, mostly mm -hmm. on the one-way streets. And so now is, can we vote on that or what would the next step be? From what I understood, we could then, you know, vote i guess on pulling those one-way streets uh yeah so you want to pull that proposal from the um from the draft local law correct to create yeah. these one-way streets yeah all changes to one-way streets yeah it could. sounds like all the comments were in favor of that I, I i didn't catch all of them but it sounded like everybody was in favor of that the, from the public no no some, there were some that weren't oh okay At least one or two so I think it was mixed, but, uh, you know. I um, so I would, uh, you know, I, I would keep it open for another week just to play it safe. Can we pull that now though? Or when do we do that? Yeah, so, um, yes. Yeah, so you, you could certainly um, pull it now and, and have it available at the clerk's office, you know, have a revised version available at the clerk's office and, and give people another week. They okay. want to stop by and look or post it on the website. Okay. And give Sounds them good. another opportunity to make further comments if they so desire. Okay. Okay. okay um, we do have one more person that has a hand raised for public okay. comment, um, Billy Fields. Yeah, hey, how you doing? Uh, Billy Fields, 11 Locust Ridge in the village. Um, and being on this street now for the last 15 years and dealing with um, the traffic around the times when the street is one way, um, pretty much obviously nonstop over the last couple of years, but just having it as being a, a piece of what we deal with living in the village. We do have off street parking for ourselves here, but uh, many of the homes um, on this street um, have odd um, arrangements for off-street parking. There's only a couple that really doesn't have any off-street parking at all. Um, I personally love the idea of going one way um, simply because we get every one-way um, bus and every one-way ambulance on our street already. Um, 
and I see a, a real benefit for safety of both kids and traffic by actually taking a locust bridge one way so that you are uh, one way out towards uh, Main Street as the buses and the ambulances travel. Um, I think that having the parking on both sides of the streets and having traffic go both ways, and this is both for Orchard and for Locust Ridge, requires everyone to pull over to allow the other person to go, which is nice. It's friendly. It's a very neighborly thing to do. I enjoy flashing my lights to allow the opposing driver to take the right of way. But <laughs> these streets are obviously not built for parking on both sides and two-way traffic. They're simply not wide enough uh, to safely navigate both vehicles and pedestrians. And uh, again, especially when school is dropping off, picking up, and when there's an emergency. Um, I've been on my street a number of times when ambulances have had a hard time getting through Locust Ridge out to 301 to get to the emergency. So um, I, I very much uh, am in favor of going to a one-way opposite up at the top of the village. Thank you, Bill. Do we have anyone else, Jeff? Nobody else. Okay. So a uh, bit of mix here. Um, some things I definitely didn't think of. People by driveways being blocked a little bit and people not being able to back up in one direction or the other. Um, so again, I think a, a study um, is, is the way to go on, on that, um, on this. So. I'd like to make a motion to pull uh, the changes to all one-way streets from the uh, chapter and, and revise to show um, that they've been pulled. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mm. Aye. So uh, Dave, a question for you on railroad. Yes. One of the, um, one of the concerns that I don't remember who put that proposal forward, but one of the concerns was trucks getting stuck at the top of railroad turning onto stone. And I think that's what was attempting to be alleviated with that shift. Mm -hmm. um, will there, in absence of changing the direction, it did get added to the, to the, to the uh, truck limitation, right? So we will have addressed it in a different way. We will have addressed that issue in a different way. It is, it is added. Okay, so we, we, we knocked out the big concern that was driving that. And the others, I think, I think it's a great idea to do expanded Kathleen, conversations. Kathleen, I, I think that in many cases, trucks ignore the signs, but- All too what, true. It, but yeah, it it's, was proposed to be added to the, to the code. All too true. Okay. So uh, thank you. So now we can go back to, uh, are the ones that we can close tonight? Uh, we'll leave 126 open till- Sorry, Dave, we've got 132 to go through yet. Oh, sorry. And that I think is Fran. This is my, my punchline, description of changes to 132. Waterfront consistency review. This is a new chapter. The purpose of this chapter is to implement consistency review regulations and procedures for the Village of Cold Springs Local Waterfront Revitalization Program, LWRP. Provide agencies of the Village of Cold Spring with a framework to consider the policies and purposes contained in the LWRP when reviewing private applications for actions or when reviewing direct agency actions which are proposed to occur within the Village's coastal area and to assure that proposed private actions and direct agency actions are consistent with said policies and purposes of the LWRP. To point okay. out that the entire, um, New York State has defined the coastal area in our, in our area to be all the land between the Hudson River and Route 9. So the entire village is within the um, New York State coastal area. So this would apply to the entire village. Any comments on that? OK. 
Okay. So, um, do you want to make uh, recommendations or uh, for chapters to be closed, Marie, or how do you, yes. how do you want to work? So, um, from what I've noted, uh, there were no comments on chapter 64. So, I would like to make a motion to close the public hearing on chapter 64. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, chapter 101, shopping carts. I heard no comments on that. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to, um, uh, to uh, um, end the public hearing on chapter 101. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. For chapter 108, which is streets and sidewalks, um, I heard no comments on chapter 108, so I'd like to make a motion to close the public hearing on chapter 108. I'll second. I'm sorry, Dave, Dave's got it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, there was a comment on... Uh, 114. Thank you. On 114... About I would eight, draw yeah. the comment. <laughs> What's no, that? I checked. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I checked, and uh, my my comment about ASTM numbers and full covers, the the New York State Building Code is very general, and you get bounced to ASTM, which then defines very clearly what a full cover is and what it is. And so I get it. And so I I, I withdraw my objection to my issue with there. Okay, then with that withdrawn. There were no comments on chapter 114 swimming pools. So I make a motion to close the hearing on chapter 114. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Chapter 126. That the the motion I think that you made, Dave, did you make a motion on that to hold it open for another week? Uh, I didn't make a motion because I didn't know when our next uh, when our next date would be or I Specifically, I'd like to keep it open for another week or whenever our next meeting is. Okay, so that would be next Tuesday. So right. I understood us to have agreed to have taken out the one way streets and the related stop issues, right. correct? Which will meet some work, yeah. Yes. Okay, so tonight, what we're, we're, take, we're agreeing to take that out and to keep the public hearing open. Yeah. Okay. Does it need a second? Well, I, I think we just need a date or to make make a make a motion to hold it open till whatever the date is. I don't know the date. What is it? Under. One, two, three, four, fifth. October, October fifth. Five. Mm -hmm. October fifth. Okay. okay, so I'll make a motion to uh, keep one uh, chapter one twenty six open um, for public comment uh, until October fifth at our next scheduled meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And lastly, I make a motion to close the public hearing on chapter 132, which is the waterfront consistency review. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So done. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, those who gave comments and stuck with us. Thank you. Uh, it's important to uh, contribute. And uh, so thank you. Uh, next is a discussion on 134 um, uh, zoning. Um, I, we, at the last meeting, I, you know, I talked to John first and uh, regarding the zoning and the changes we were gonna make, especially to Marathon from I-1 to MU-1. Um, and so, um, I had a discussion with him about PUDs and about, you know, my, my main concern is having as much control as we can over changes that we make. So uh, um, I've asked John to be here tonight and John suggested that we also have our planner, Ted Fink, uh, with us. Um, don't know if he's here or not, but- uh, He is. I'm here. He's been, Ted has been helping us through the, uh, through all of our, our uh, chapters and all of our uh, changes. So uh, welcome, Ted. and. Uh, I guess I'll uh, shoot it over to John. And John, if you could maybe explain um, 
the change and maybe uh, implications of the change and maybe uh, how we can best, uh, the best leverage or the way that we can best control development of that area. So they're both beneficial to the uh, developer and the uh, residents of the area and residents of the village as a whole. Um, okay, well, let me start by kind of quickly explaining what a, what a PUD is or a planned unit development is. Um, so essentially a PUD and Ted, correct me if I'm wrong or you're free to add when I'm done, but just really short, a PUD is essentially a floating zone. So the, the, uh, the village board would adopt legislation creating a, a planned unit development district and it wouldn't necessarily apply to any specific lot at this point. Uh, there would be certain criteria or conditions that have to be met in order to be eligible for this PUD. Uh, and that would all be in the legislation and it would kind of lay out, you know, what specific criteria, what things you're looking for, what things, you know, what type of develop, mixed use, uh, would kind of lay it all out in the legislation itself. Then the next step after the village board actually creates this, and I call it, a, they call it a floating zone because it's just kind of floating up there above the village and doesn't really specifically apply to any lot until you complete step two, which is usually when a developer or a property owner comes in with a specific idea based upon this PUD legislation and then asks that their property be designated uh, this PUD. And so they would submit a petition to the village board. It would mainly be a legislative action. There would be some criteria or conditions that the village board would look at. Uh, but upon receipt of this petition, one of the first things the village board would normally do in these PUDs is refer the application to the planning board. So the planning board would review it, make a recommendation. Planning board might even be the lead agency for purposes of CECRA. Uh, it could be the uh, village board, it could be the planning board. And then they, the planning board can then refer it back to the village board with a recommendation. And at that point, the village board could then make a finding that, okay, yes, this specific property, it can and it does qualify for a PUD. So we're going to establish it's no longer zoned whatever R1 and it's now zoned a PUD. And then the next step after that would uh, most likely be some type of site plan review before the planning board, because, you know, before the village board, you're kind of dealing with conceptual, con you know, conceptual, um, CECRA is more conceptual. So once the developer knows that, okay, the village has designated this as a PUD, they're, they're, they're okay with the concept. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of back and forth. Um, then they would, you know, the planning board would have the last uh, review. The last step would be the planning board site plan review, and then they can kind of get into the details. And, you know, that's generally how a PUD works. Um, you know, so that's really just a basic 101 of a, of a PUD. And I apologize if I'm repeating myself. I wasn't at the, or somebody else, because I wasn't at the meeting last month. But, you know, so that's that's kind of how a PED works. There, there are benefits uh, to the developer because it provides flexibility. And there are benefits to the municipality because, <laughs> uh, you know, they have flexibility as well. They're not subject to the rigid zoning. And, you know, it, it's usually a cooperation between the developer and the municipality to, to try to provide the best uh, development for everybody. Yeah, Dave, I, I, what I'd like to say is I, I probably couldn't have said it any better myself. I think John gave you an excellent description of what a, a PUD is. They do come in a lot of different um, shapes and sizes and so forth, but I think the general concept of a PUD uh, is exactly as John said. It, it puts control both in the village board's hands as well as the planning board. So it's a two-step process for the developer to go through um, a PUD application. And it's generally reserved for larger areas that are deserving of a, um, you know, a, a more intensive focus for planning purposes. Uh, so it, it doesn't necessarily work on very small sites, but for the village, the 15-acre marathon site is, uh, is a rather large site. Um, the other um, property, I think there's two properties that I saw in the, um, 
in the zoning map um, and one at the, the northern end of the village as well along the railroad. Um, and so those are the kinds of properties that um, are pretty much tailor-made for PUD type development. So a question to, uh, to both of you. Um, if, if to develop to develop the land or uh, what, it, what gives the uh, gives the village the most uh, leverage and uh, you know to, to come out with a you know a good project. I mean, right now we have the choice of leaving it as I one um, or changing it to what we were proposing to MU one um, or now a PUD. Um, from my so I, I guess that's my question. It seems like the PUD gives us. John exited, so Ted, if you'd like to. <laughs> I had to call yeah. for, uh, the cleaner for here. <laughs> All right. John, um, you want to take that? You want me to take that question? No, I mean, so yeah, I, I think the PUD, like I said, it provides flexibility for both sides. Um, and, and, you know, it is a, it's a collaborative process, so to speak, between the municipality and the developer, uh, because there is so much flexibility. And I, I do think that um, you know when you when you look back on the comprehensive plan that was adopted, it's now 10 years old. Um, nevertheless, it does have some specific recommendations for the marathon site, and um, I think it's uh, goal number seven seven point two, an objective um, about ensuring development of properties in the marathon area um, results in improvements that are well integrated into the fabric of the community protect the natural environment and health of residents, promote the economic health of the village through positive tax impact and economic activity. And there's, there's a lot of recommendations in here for uh, tax impact. There are recommendations for considering mixed uses on the property, um, making sure that any development that happens in, in um, the marathon area takes into consideration the limited access to that part of the village. Um, so there's a lot of types of standards that can be um, uh, written into the PUD regulations. And I think that it's, uh, it is an important um, goal to look at the kinds of things that would be protective of the village's character, um, because if they are the, you know, a couple of the largest remaining undeveloped lands um, in the village. <clears throat> Don, anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would add, and, and, and Ted correctly, you know, his reference to the comprehensive plan is, is absolutely on point because, you know, one of the things you want to make sure is that with any proposed legislation, uh, it has to be consistent, you know, any zoning legislation has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So when you do craft the PUD, as Ted pointed out, uh, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're consistent with the comp plan. I guess uh, questions from the board, John or, or Ted. Um, can I ask a question? If we if we decide to go with a PUD, the property as it is now, does that is it labeled an I one or an MU one until such time that the owner requests to be a PUD, or is it labeled anything, or what is it labeled? So it would be. I guess it depends. So right now it's a, it's an industrial one. If you decide to pull the proposed MU1 for that property, then it would stay industrial one. I mean, I guess theoretically you could still change it to an MU1 and adopt the PUD, um, but I don't, I don't know if that's exactly what the village wants to do. I think, I think the idea is, you know, industrial is not going to work. Um, you know, so. It, I think the PUD provides, you know, the MU1 does provide some mixed uses and some flexibility, but I think the PUD would provide more flexibility. Um, so until, you know, even if you adopt and create this PUD, no property is designated a PUD. Like I said, it's just sitting up there and, and, and the marathon site would remain industrial one. Um, you know, whatever it is, it stays unless and until the property owner comes in to petition for a PUD designation for that specific property. Right. So you're adopting the tool. You're you're adopting the planning tool into the code. Yeah. And and when an application comes forward, 
that tool is available to to sort of mutually agree on what right. happens on the site. Right. Yeah. The, the way that I look at it is that what you do is you create the framework for it by adding the text to the zoning that provides all the specifications for how a planned unit development would get approved. But the floating part of it that John has been talking about comes in with um, the zoning map that in order to uh, implement the actual plan unit development on any particular site, there has to be a zoning map amendment that takes that floating zone mm -hmm. and lands it somewhere it. On, on, exactly, on a map. And that's the zoning trigger that the village board has um, uh, by doing the zoning amendment for the, um, for the PUD zone as a floating zone. And how, how, um, how specific do you, do we craft the PUD to be at this point while it's floating? Or is it very broad categories? I mean, I know it, that, I know that the, the uh, specificity will build as the process goes out, but where do you start with definitions? How, how broad are the definitions at the start? Well, right. and I, draw from yeah. the, draw from those goals and the comprehensive plan. Yes. Yes, they do. And generally what they do is they provide for all of the procedures that the village board would file at an applicant if they wanted to um, actually land that floating zone onto a particular parcel of land such as Marathon, that an applicant would come in and would have to follow those procedures that are set out in the text of the zoning uh, for the PUD um, floating zone. Right. And, and that, of course, uh, you know, that's, that's the opportunity too to establish standards for that, um, you know, for instance, to, um, to identify what are appropriate uses um, for the PUD, um, you know, what are the kinds of site plan issues that need to be um, identified and, and uh, followed as part of the plan. Generally, um, to make an application for a PUD, it begins with a conceptual plan so that uh, an applicant might file an actual application for a PUD um, uh, zoning change. And that would include some conceptual plans to show the layout where residential might go, where some of the mixed uses uh, might go. Um, you know, there's a variety of different uses that were identified in the comprehensive plan, um, residential, recreational, open space, work live units, small retail, office uses, um, and to permit them uh, by requiring special use permits. So there, there is a variety of uses that are already um, outlined in the comprehensive plan for, uh, for that. And uh, there could be um, special requirements to keep a certain percentage of the property um, as open space. Um, you know, there might be specific parking requirements that differ from uh, uh, the rest of the, the zoning for the village. There might be different lighting standards. There might be um, standards to ensure compatibility of use. There, you know, there, it's pretty much open as far as um, what you would want to um, include in there. And uh, I think the, the important thing is to take a look at some, there are a lot of good examples of the kinds of, of requirements that would go into a PUD district. Um, and to, to take a look at some of those and, and to explore uh, your options because it, you know, there's all manner of plan unit developments that have been um, created uh, throughout New York and, and other states. And it sounds like the PUD allows uh, the capacity to be more restrictive than it might be, than, than might be available under straight, under straight zoning. We can, we can sort of tune in on very, particular issues as part of the PUD on for that, for whatever location applies to, to draw down the PUD. Yes. Yes. And I, I think some of the examples of, of this would be, uh, you know, perhaps there would be um, additional development that could be permissible within a PUD. Uh, if, for instance, you know, there, there might be a minimum requirement of 20% open space or 25% open space. And, and if the applicant devoted a certain percentage of, of the units to um, uh, to target, you know, a certain income group for affordable housing, workforce housing, that sort of thing, um, that they might be given a, a bonus in the number of units, uh, or, you know, if they if they went to 50% open space, you know, or took the open space and allowed for public use as opposed to restricting it to 
private use for the residents of the development. You know, there's there's a whole uh, wide range of, of different options uh, available so, to, to consider for that. So it gives you flexibility on impact mitigation too. Correct, yeah. correct. And oftentimes I've seen the PUD district regulations uh, closely intertwine with the seeker requirements. And, uh, uh, you know, as John said, it could be the village board that's lead agency, could be the planning board, uh, you know, and uh, so the seeker, if it was done by the village board, for instance, could be done in a generic manner with some additional site specific um, seeker done by the planning board. Um, you know, if, if the conceptual plans were to change once they got uh, the actual approval to have the zoning map change um, uh, approved. So basically, though, if we changed it to, uh, um, it, it, it's all triggered by the, uh, by the applicant. If the applicant's happy with the zoning, then he doesn't, you know, we can't, you know, institute or lay the floating zone on his property. So if he's happy with I-1 right now, he can go ahead and build per code. Or if we change it to MU-1, he could build per code. It doesn't mean we can't do that or institute the, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, to the uh, PUD, uh, it would be up to the applicant. Uh, generally speaking, it's, it's usually a petition from the applicant, yes. I think what the one sample I gave you, Dave, I think it actually said either the town or the property owner. But it's it's usually an applicant that comes in with a, a concept of, of how they want to develop it. So I would say 95% of the time it's got to come in from the applicant because they have the proposed concept and that's, you know, then they work with the village or, or, or town. But I guess in this in this situation, if we change it to an MU one and the applicant was happy with that, there's no way for the village to impose the PUD. No, no. I, if I would, if you're really going to go the PUD route, I would just leave it industrial. I one. Okay. Ted, would you agree that PUDs give more leverage to the village? Well, I think it's um, because of the, the two-step process, um, you have first a legislative decision that has to be made before it can even go to the planning board, that there is greater flexibility um, to allow the village board to have a say in, in the development of the property. Okay. But it establishes standards ahead of time so that, so that there, are, there are guardrails in that, in that process. Correct. Right. Any other questions on this? I guess the next question is how, or how would you proceed if you wanted to do the first step, which is, you know, put together uh, or design or craft the, the, uh, the regulations or whatever you want to put into the PUD? I would start with, uh, you know, looking at other samples, uh, you know, and that, that would kind of be the first place I would look and, and you know, what, you know, you guys have to discuss what type of PUD is there going to be a specific emphasis? You know, do you want something where it's, it's mixed use? Do you want something where it's just senior housing? Uh, do you want something as Ted mentioned before, where it's workforce housing, uh, you know, or maybe you don't want any specific goal um, being emphasized and it's just generally a, a mixed use development. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the first step is to kind of figure out what you guys want from this PUD uh, in general terms. And then, you know, I think you, you kind of look at other samples and, you know, Ted could, you know, I'm sure Ted has probably drafted PUDs in the past. Uh, I've worked on some myself, but I think, you know, Ted's probably been more in the weeds on these than I have as far as the specific language. Yeah, yeah, um, it's true. I have worked on a number of them. And I think, uh, you know, as, as John said earlier, the guidepost is probably the comprehensive plan uh, is to make sure that the recommendations and if you look at objective 7.2, you'll see that there's 11, 12 or so. Um, well, there's 15 different recommendations for um, for that area. And I think it's, uh, 
you know, if, if there's anything that would be contrary with that, then you would be looking probably at, at potential amendments to the comprehensive plan if you wanted to act contrary to that. But keep in mind that the comprehensive plan, um, the way that it was worded, it was carefully worded. Uh, these are recommendations, um, they say, for the village to consider. Um, you know, for instance, consider rezoning, um, uh, you know, a former marathon site as, as mixed uses. So you have the basis in there that's already been laid in the comprehensive plan to do that. Um, and I think you want to operate in the bounds of that, because if you don't, you come up against that consistency provision in New York State Village Law that John was talking about. Um, you want to make sure that any any sort of changes that you do institute are going to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So, are there? Uh, so, can you send us some uh, some drafts or something that we could look at and maybe get a better feel for it, and uh, then get back to you? Or that would absolutely be really sure. Help. I'd be glad to put together a package to show you what other communities have done with PUDs and send them along to you and um, and have you review them and and maybe get a better sense of what's involved in this. Yeah, Ted, if you have anything from a, a similar situated village, you know, I've yep. got some that I've worked on in town settings. Um, yep. I don't know if it really makes a difference, but um, I couldn't really locate one for a village. Okay. And, and um, I'll does, work on them. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can. I can begin to look at, at uh, some of these things tomorrow and I'll pull together a whole package and, and get it to you. Can I ask Electronic a question at some point? I don't want to interrupt the discussion, but. Well, you, you are interrupting. So could you hold for a second, please? Thank you. Sure. sure. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, so where are you going on there, Ted? Sorry. I, yeah, I no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at what I have on um, um, in my files and get you some examples of some of the ones that I know have been successfully used in other municipalities. Um, include, you know, putting an emphasis on, on villages where land areas are, are more limited. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Is anything else from the board, um, that John or Ted? So uh, John and Ted, I think when we spoke on this topic, um, size would be um, a factor. That is that uh, the size of the area would, would have to be, a, an area would have to be of a certain size to qualify for a floating zone. And that if a property currently is made up of more than one text parcel, they could be combined to achieve a larger size. Is that, are those both correct? Yes, I believe they are. Yeah, I think you probably want to hear from John too to just confirm that. Yeah, no, usually in the PUDs, they allow you to combine parcels as part of the application process. Okay, and I, I think you also said that as part of the, um, I don't think it was a step one, but- I hear you. One, sorry. I think that's better if you're closer. Okay. Right here, uh, right I, I think that you said that as uh, prior to step one, um, that the requirements in the floating zone would include a specific minimum size of acreage. And that those properties within the village that conform to that size, that minimum size, mm -hmm. should be identified in advance. Yes. Yes, because as part of the secret analysis, you're going to have to, or Ted's going to have to look at, you know, all right, how many properties can this be applied to? And, okay. and do yep. his, you know, he'll have to do some type of generic secret analysis. Okay. Uh, so um, given where we are right now, where we have a current zone, a current code that has I-1 and a proposed code that has MU-1, uh, do you recommend that we we withdraw MU1 from the code or leave it in? Um, I, I guess I'm not sure of all the properties that the MU1 
applies to. I, I think it falls on a couple other properties on the other side of the village by the uh, mayor's park. It, yes, the um, properties that are currently zoned I-1 are Marathon, some properties on the boulevard, some properties on Rock Street, mm -hmm. and then the properties that begin at Northern Avenue and go north to the end of Mayor's Park. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, what, what option would be to, you know, just remove it from the Marathon parcel and or, or any other larger parcel and, and keep it on the others? Um, as it turns out, the other parcels are currently developed. Mm -hmm. So the rezoning really doesn't buy them anything. Mm -hmm. Unless a, re a proposal were to come forward to redevelop them. And then you have the option to use the PUD at that time. They're too small. They're too small. I think we were talking about um, a minimum lot size of five acres. Okay. No, I was saying keep the MU1 on, you know, I, I think you're proposing the MU1 zone on, you know, however many parcels within the village. Uh, perhaps you want to keep the MU1 proposed for some of the smaller lots in the village and, and lift it on the larger lots. Well, the, my point was that the smaller lots in the village that are currently zoned I-1 and be, are being proposed to go to MU1 are currently already developed. Okay, well, so, I mean, that would, I mean, most of the village is already developed, so um, it, if it's I one MU one, I think is gives gives them more options, I guess, for the setbacks if they ever want to add or um, you know put additions on. So you know whether it's developed, you know, it could always be redeveloped. It could be a tear down and a rebuild. So you know, I, I guess it's up to the village board if uh, if the lots are already developed and you just want to keep them as I one. I guess that's an option too. It would be easiest to keep them as I one. Can you say that again, Marie? It would certainly be easiest to keep I one and not implement the change to MU one. Okay, I guess that would be the discussion for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, one last question for you. Um, the last meeting that the village board had on the uh, chapter 134 zoning was about a week and a half ago. At that time, comments were received. The, um, we did not close the public hearing. So what should our action be for whatever we propose to do with chapter 134? Do we need an um, a continuation of the current public hearing? Do we close the public, current public hearing and have schedule a new public hearing or, or what? What do you recommend? So uh, I guess it kind of depends on what you're gonna do. I mean, so when is the public hearing continued until what the next the meeting on Tuesday? The next we, haven't, we, haven't set, we haven't set a new date for the continuation. Oh, you never set a specific date for the continuation? Correct. That is correct. There was never a vote for a, 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 the date for the continuation. Okay. So I think you should notice for the continued public hearing so that way everyone knows a specific date uh, and allow additional public comment based upon this potential change um, to the proposed zoning amendments. That implies that we have that implies that we have the zoning amendment. I, Marie, can you say you're garbled? Could you say that again? That implies that we have the zoning amendment. From what John just said, mm -hmm. I got it. No, the only change would be just keeping everything I one. I think the PUD is. If you're going to go the PUD route, that's probably going to have to come separately at another time. Gotcha. You know. It's up to you, but it's going to take a little while for you guys to figure out what you want, right? Or for Ted to kind of draft it, and you guys have to look at it, and you have to go through Secra, and it's got to go to the county, um, you know. So, 
I, I think if, if you're anxious to adopt the, the zoning amendments, then you might just want to revert back and keep them I-1 and then start the process you know, on the PUD, but I think that's got to be done separately. Mm -hmm. so that we, seems like the most, I'm sorry, Dave, who, did I interrupt? If we wanted to keep the I-1, John, then we would have to change that, um, you know, yeah. back to I-1 or from the proposal, we're not going to be changing. Well, we have, we need to change that. So does that change? I think Marie, to Marie's question, does that change the public hearing or how we have to notice that? Or do we close that and make the change and then have, open it to the public again? No, well, uh, I mean, technically the public hearing was never closed. It was just never set for a specific date. Okay. So you're gonna put out a notice for a continuation of a public hearing on the proposed zoning amendments. And in the clerk's office, if you guys so desire, um, you know, you can basically eliminate the MU1 and that way people will see it. I would even send it back to the county for their additional comments. Um, and, and maybe, you know, letting them know that we plan on adopting a PUD separately uh, at a separate time so that they know what's going on. And, um, you know, so and get feedback on, on that change as far as eliminating the proposed MU1 and in the future, uh, creating this PUD to, as, as a replacement, so to speak. Okay. Uh, one, just so that everyone is aware, MU1 is mentioned in chapter 104, I think. So we're going to have to go back and amend chapter 104, which we had already closed the public hearing on. Have any, is that the only place where there were other chapters or were no, there other chapters? The only, it's the only chapter that mentions MU1. Signs, and that, and, signs and placards is the chapter. Okay, and is that one of the ones that has been sent to the state already? No, I, it was part of uh, public hearing three. Okay, okay, so we don't have, Jeff, we have Jeff, space yeah. to undo that. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Public hearing three, we have not passed the resolution for the chapters for public hearing three, specifically because it contains uh, chapter, the uh, signs and placards which refer to um, to MU1, uh, we would have to have a new public hearing on that chapter on 104 to make a change to it. We would make the change and then have the public hearing. Yes, Just, yes. Since it was closed. Yes. Okay. I think uh, I think this approach for the PUD is brilliant for handling this question. Okay, so um, there might be some questions from uh, from the residents or the public to John or uh, or or to Ted. So can you guys hang on for a little bit or take a few questions if they are? Depends on the questions. <laughs> <laughs> can I do that too? <laughs> no, you're their elected official. <laughs> I can always claim attorney-client privilege. Uh, okay, um, are there... Alan. Yes, I apologize. first of all, I apologize for interrupting. Most of the Zoom calls I'm on, if you're not supposed to speak, you're uh, muted by the host. So I thought it was okay to just make sure that I got a chance to ask my question. In the current, um, there was an article about this zoning change and uh, the author wrote, in addition to the property on Kimball, the eastern portion of the south side of Rock Street would become part of the mixed use zone. My name is Alan Wernick. I'm a resident of Rock Street. I'm trying to figure out where that is first, uh, what, what area their piece of property they're talking about. And secondly, why would it be included in the discussion of rezoning the marathon site? Those, so those are my two questions. So currently the uh, marathon property, a number of properties on the boulevard and a few properties on Rock Street are zoned MU1. If you take yeah, a look at this, if you take a look at the zoning map, it appears as if there was not a straight line was drawn from the Marathon properties north, including the boulevard and and some properties on Rock Street. Correct. The proposal, if you look at the new proposed zoning map, those properties on the boulevard and Rock Street 
are being proposed to be changed from I1 to R1. There may have been one that was being proposed to be changed to R3. Ah, oh, yes, uh, Forgegate is currently, a portion of Forgegate is currently zoned I1. So rather than make it MU1, the proposal in the, in the proposed zoning map was identifying it as R3. Why, why, why would that be, why would there be, I'm, I'm just trying to understand why would there be consideration of rezoning that property? So the marathon property, I understand it's, it's a, you know, it's empty and somebody might want to do something there. The, the part you're talking about has houses on it. Why, why is there an effort to rezone that? I'm just curious why that would be included in that. And the reason I'm concerned about it as a Rock Street resident is that I would not like to see substantial changes to that portion of Rock Street. So certainly we can leave the, the Rock Street residences sorry, the Rock Street uh, tax lots that are currently zoned I-1, we can leave them I-1, that's not a problem. I think uh, the, the change to the R-1 would just make those properties the same as yours or your neighbors. Well, would there be, I guess my, my concern is, would there be options for the owners of that property to do anything different than would they have any right to do anything different than they have the right to do now? Right now, I-1 requires a minimum of 40,000 square feet. If it was changed to R-1, the minimum lot size would become 7,500 square feet. The setbacks for I-1 are significant, the front, side, and rear setbacks. And in R-1, the front yard setback is 25 feet, the side yard setbacks are 10 feet, and the rear yard setback is 20 feet. So there are significant differences. The coverage, lot size coverage, is 30% in R1. I can't remember what it is in I1. Would it have any impact on the historic, uh, no. the historic district? No, none whatsoever. Okay, like that, that was my concern. No, no, no change to the historic. The historic district boundaries are different than the zoning boundaries. Wow, that's helpful. You got to it. Thank you so much. It was You're worth waiting well. for. <laughs> okay, before we get any other questions, are there questions specifically for either Ted or John after hearing discussion on PUD? Because if there aren't, then I'd like to have those guys can, you know, <laughs> continue their regular evening. <laughs> if, if they're not specific to John or Ted, um, then yeah, just hold off. We'll take your questions, but. One other person has their hand raised, Karen. Hi, um, I'm Karen Mashke. I am Hi, the are, president this, this... of the board of managers of Forgegate, which was just mentioned by Mary. And I was wondering if you could clarify your comment about the zoning with regard to Okay, so this isn't, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is this not specific to John? Or, uh, or oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Got this, it. I will get to, we'll get to you in a second. I just want to let the guys go. <laughs> we'll get right back to you. Are, is there anyone out there uh, that needs any clarification or have a question for John or Ted Flanner? No one else has their hands raised. Okay, great. Ted and John, thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, so now we can get back to Karen. <laughs> I think. Okay, was sorry, I missed that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard Mary make a comment about uh, zoning in response to the person on Rock Street. Uh, she mentioned Forgegate, and I'm the president of the Forgegate Board of Managers, and just wondered if you could clarify what you were saying about that because I wasn't able to quite get that. Currently, there is- You need to get, so Marie, whenever you're talking, you have to move up a little because we can't hear you. Thanks. Okay, okay. so <laughs> the I mean, southeastern portion, the southeastern portion of Forgegate uh, is currently zoned I-1, which makes no sense. But, but that is the, if you take a look at the current zoning map, uh, that's the way it is. And so the change would be to to uh, to be 
what what the rest of your property, what the rest of 4G property is. Got it, just to make it consistent. Okay, great. Yeah, that would be R3. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I know on our on our map that I see in the village, it has us as R3. I didn't know that portion was uh, a little different. So that's it's, great. it's a small area. Okay, Very small right. area. thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. Okay, we have one more question. Hello, I'm uh, Meyer at uh, Kemble Avenue. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my simple question is under the, in the marathon uh, lot, under the current zoning of I-1, if the uh, planned unit development aspect is not invoked by the developer, would he have the right to make an industrial installation now? Yes. I, I, yes. For our code. Yeah. So is that is that good or bad for us as a village? Uh, hard to say. It depends on what he would uh, what he would like to build there. I I, I have a feeling that um, it would be in the best interest of everyone to have a mixed use. So I mean, he's been able to. Um, for a year, I, I'm not sure when he purchased the property, but he's been able to build on it, except with the exception of the contaminated area for a while now and hasn't moved forward. So um, I, I, can't, I can't speak for the, uh, for the developer or what he would be able to do there. But. So in other words, um, refraining from changing the zoning to the mixed use and retaining the I-1 categorization with the PUD floating plan is optimal for us as a village at this time. It does not expose us to danger of um, inappropriate use of the field. Um, that, that was my intent to try to, uh, uh, whether or not that plays out or from what our attorney said and what our planner has just said that that would, uh, I think, safeguard us more. Um, Maybe I'm misinterpreting if someone else would like to chime in. I think that's accurate. Okay. I will take the board as the arbiter of this and go along with it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That does, doesn't look like there are any more comments. So if I come back to the um, scheduling of the continuation of the public hearing on chapter 134. The next date that is available is October 5th. However, that Jeff, what's the notice time? Is it business days or calendar days? It's business days. We need at least so five. Have, yeah. Yeah, we don't have it. No. So we, we can't do it on October 5th. So maybe October 7th. Yes. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah. What else is happening that night? Oh, we don't have to worry about space, clearly. We have to notice it. At this late date, we cannot get it into the paper until a week from tomorrow. Yeah. So then it's not the... Um, it's so not it's the really we're looking at the following week for us to put... We have to run a legal notice in the paper of record. So the 12th is the uh, monthly meeting. Correct. Um, which gives us probably about an hour of time. Not much more than that. <coughs> so do you want to try for October 12th? We'll do the 12th or the you want to schedule one for the 14th. I, I'm open to either. I'm okay with either at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the twelfth is our regular meeting. It's our yes. monthly meeting. What's that? Monthly meeting. Monthly meeting. Sorry. Yeah, we don't have a regular meeting. Um, I guess the fourteenth would be better. I think it's safer to do it fourteenth. Okay. Um, we may also want to do a, well, have we decided that we're going to stay with I-1 
or insert MU1. And the reason I asked the question is we could do the continuation of 134 and the approval of the change for 104. Um, how does everyone else feel? I'm, I'm, that's what I would vote for that to leave it as I want. Are we talking about um, all of the current I-1 properties or just the marathon property? Oh, well, what other MU properties will be left? Will be so currently in the proposed version. Okay. Fair are, Street, I'm sorry. I know you said this 10 times. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's few properties on the boulevard, including for smidgen of Forge Gate. Uh, I think that there is a property on Humble that's part of it as well. And then there are two or three properties on Rock. And then on Fair Street, uh, there's Nina Studio, uh, Janet Rust, Riverview, and then the Village properties. So the, um, but the Rock Street properties are not going to MU, they're going to R something, right? This is correct. 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 The um, Fair Street properties are going to MU? Correct. And the Forge Gate is going to R? R3. 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 So if we that sounded like, I'm sorry, Dave. No, go ahead. It sounded like what from what you were mentioning earlier, Marie, that you want to talk more about size. No, no, that, that the that comes under the PUD, I think. Right, right. But, but, but the, the minimum size, the minimum size to make a parcel uh, to make to make that option accessible to a property owner is it hinges on lot size. And to your point earlier, Marie, there's a big difference in lot size between those Fair Street parcels and the, and the Marathon parcel. Well, as it turns out, um, the village property is uh, conforms to, let us say, five acres. Dockside conforms to five acres. Um, the um, Three the Boulevard conforms to five acres. Scenic Hudson's property conforms to five acres. So Haldane conforms to five acres. So if the minimum size is five acres, I've just thrown out a half a dozen properties yeah. that conform to that. Well, and it seems as if with the, with the village parcel on, on Fair Street, you would, want, you would want the additional flexibility and protections afforded under PUD in that location as well, potentially. I don't want to talk about PUD tonight. Sorry. Well, but Marie, you're because you, Fran's question. No, my question was, are we going to keep all the I ones? Right. Are we going to? Are we going to keep some MU and keep keep some I? Are we just going to drop MU? Totally? I would advocate for leaving. I would advocate for leaving them I one. Is, is that makes it easier? Not easier. So the changes that have to be okay. Um, okay, so the only, the only other properties that, that I was thinking of would be the Fair Street properties. Um, so, but some of the I-1 properties we are gonna change to ours and that's gonna still go through. I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Can't hear you. We need to get you a new computer. Yes. Should we leave everything as I-1? Well, okay. remember, Fran, that under the I-1, residential uses are as of right. So it's right. Okay. So those... All right. So, so we're fine. Okay. But, but in I-1, residential use requires 40,000 square foot property. Right. Unless they're already. Which is an acre. Mm -hmm. But there but are currently houses on built. them. Okay. Right. Okay. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no problem. Okay, so start working on uh, removing MU1 and putting in I1. And getting, just, just totally getting rid of the MU designation. Yep. All right. I'll, I'll work on that with you, Marie, this week. Okay, we're gonna need a new zoning map. We're gonna need a new, need a new table, table of dimensional requirements, uh, change to 104. And, and of course, changes to 134. Okay, gotcha. 
And so should we, after the discussion where it started, uh, include 104 in the public hearing on October 12th? Yes, I think we should. October 14th. October 14th. Yeah, I think we should. Okay, I agree. Okay, I agree. So that's October 14th, it's Thursday, right? Yeah. Correct. Um, so the decision is to remove the MU1 and go with just I1 in the, in chapter 134? Yeah. I would suggest you vote on that. That someone make a motion and then the board votes to do that. I believe is what John had, suggest, had mentioned earlier. Oh, I make a motion if anybody can hear me. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> we, remove, we remove MU1 from chapter 134 and, set, and put back in I1 in chapter 134 and do the same with chapter with the signs and placards chapter. I second that motion. All in favor. I, I, can we I, I need to clarify oh. before I vote? Sorry, the I'm sorry, Dave. I need to make sure I understand what I'm voting on. The the, the um the forge gate, the forge gate parcel also stays. That little chunk of the forge gate parcel. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't impact, it doesn't impact because that's what it is now. Okay. So I'm ready to vote. So I vote aye. All well, in favor? Aye. 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 We just give a thumbs up. Go please. <laughs> Okay. Okay, we have, we have some more business. Yes, we do. Um, next is uh, resolution uh, number 66-2021, declaring items of surplus. Whereas the village is in position, uh, possession of equipment that is uh, obsolete, no longer needed. Well, I'll make a motion to uh, declare these items surplus. Second. Okay, whereas the village is in possession of equipment that is obsolete, no longer needed and or in disrepair and can be sold. And whereas the following equipment is no longer needed for village use, uh, yet may still have some value. Um, here are a list of things, uh, 1987 GMC Sierra 4x4 utility truck, 1999 Ford F-150 4x4 pickup, 1989 International S9, uh, S-1900 six wheel dump truck, 1992 Ford F-350 custom 4x4 dump truck, 1997 Ford F-350 uh, 4x4 dump truck with plow, Ford Think electric car, Ford F-1500 uh, tractor, uh, John Deere V-twin 54 lawn tractor, 2016 liquid brine system, and 22 foot long garland with uh, colored lights. That should be 26, 22 foot long garlands. My apologies. Okay. There's and 26 of them. <laughs> I don't see the uh, um, the container, the eight by 40 foot container there. Is it supposed uh, to be there? Yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be there. Yeah. I think it's eight, it might be 10 by, might be 10 by 40. Uh, was used by the building. It might have been boats or bridges, whatever it was, and they left it there. Oh, it's sitting there, useless to us. Oh, so can we? It wasn't that? on the list that okay. was given me. So it's just a, a trailer uh, container, metal. So, so list as amended to it to it include the eight by forty container. Yeah, it's eight by or ten by. I'm not sure what it is. Right. I'll get the specifics from like to obtain fair market value for the equipment through the use of an applicable legal method. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved that the village board of the village of Cold Spring declares the above listed equipment a surplus and authorizes their sale through available legal methods. Trustee Early? Yes. Trustee Foley? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Woods? Thumbs up. Um, <laughs> Mayor Morandi. Aye. Just so the public knows, um, there are a few things that here might be of value. Uh, many of them are like rusted out and can only be used for parts. They will be going to an auction house that deals with municipal surplus. Um, and they've already taken photos and stuff and are ready to go. So we can uh, move all of this off of the property, hopefully. So thank you. 
Next, uh, Marie, if you want to take the Park Mobile. Yeah, so you've all seen the Park Mobile agreement. Um, I've sent you some additional data about it. Are there any questions or comments? No. I do then, I make, then I make a motion to authorize the mayor to sign the Park Mobile agreement. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. There's tweets. Thank you for your work on this, Marie. It's taken forever. Back, not not your fault, but back and forth. So thank you. Um, next, we have. It's just a minute left, or am I missing something? No. Bill. No. No. I'll make a motion to approve batch number six one nine four in the amount of twenty thousand six hundred and fourteen dollars and ninety four cents. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. And then finally, is it the minutes now? I'm not looking at the agenda. Yes. Correct. The minutes of September 7th. September, yeah, okay. So I'll make a motion to accept the minutes for uh, Village Board Trustees public hearing on Tuesday, September 7th. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Is there any public comment? Any? Anyone remaining? Nope. Speak now. Getting awake is a different question. <laughs> nope. Okay. No questions. Anything from the board? No. I'm make, a make, make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you, you everyone. All. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Hope you feel better. Yes, feel better. <laughs>